Good morning to you. Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your hurricane outlook and discussion for the first day of August 2017. Let's start off with this nice graphic put together by the Rosenthal School of Marine and Atmospheric Science down at the University of Miami. And this shows us the distribution of Atlantic tropical cyclones from 1966 through 2015. So a more modern time frame than going back to 1851. Some of the times we see that graph going pretty, you know, pretty far back in time. And so we are right here, the first day of August. And I want you to notice that, you know, all of the activity is very low, even still as we enter the first part of August. The major hurricanes are practically nil. Uh, the occurrences of hurricanes very low. And even the occurrences of tropical storms during this first part of August still on the time scale that we're talking about here, very, very low. And so even though we are entering what we call the busiest time of the season, it's not until later. I mean, look, there's still a pretty substantial dip that's not much more active than where we are now uh, out to August 10th, for goodness sakes. It's really not until about the 20th through the end of the month here, that, especially with major hurricanes, that things really start to pick up, and they do so in a hurry. It's almost like a switch being turned on, and we see that especially in active years. Not until later August does, you know, do we typically look for prolific development, and I like to think of August 15th through the 20th as the start of that. So we're still a couple of weeks out. I just wanted to kind of show you that. The first 10 days of August, going back to 1851 on this particular graphic, you can see the main development region speckled with several areas of origin dating all the way back to then. And you say, well, how did they know back in 1851? Well, maybe not so much out here, but you know, there were certainly ships that kept detailed records, and uh, especially when you got over here through the Antilles, even all the way back to 1851. So, you know, the records are not that great, but there is enough evidence to help fill in some of those holes. Gulf of Mexico is pretty busy relative to other times of the year uh, during this first part of August, and we saw that you know, yesterday, uh, right before August began, I guess you could say, with Emily. And then, of course, the Southeast Pacific typically remains fairly busy. And you notice, too, generally the lack of activity in the Caribbean. Watch as we go through August into September how that begins to change. You know, there's normally this pretty strong band of wind shear that comes through. A lot of it because this is busy over here. Air is coming up over here, sinking and spreading out over here. Very typical, and that's why this looks the way it does, that we don't have that much activity uh, in the early part of August. It takes longer, so just keep waiting. Uh, looking out there today, the remnants of Emily, about the only thing to talk about right there. We'll see what happens in the Gulf as this frontal system still remains behind. Maybe the focal point from some, for some development later on. But we'll see. I'm not really seeing much in the models to get too concerned about. In the meantime, dry air and dust still emanating from Africa. And there's the leading edge of it there. And this will eventually make its way all the way over, even to Texas, believe it or not. So you might have some nice sunsets coming up soon. And even though yesterday Miami escaped the 90s, that heat, that oppressive heat, will be coming back. Uh, part of this surge coming in will lead the way uh, as well once all this mess lifts out. It'll be hot and humid again back in South Florida after a very, very warm July. So here is what we have in the leftovers department of Emily. Uh, one little band of thunderstorms right here. You know, if you go out to the beach here, Daytona, down to Cape Canaveral, Cocoa, etc., New Smyrna Beach, and you look east, you might be able to see some of these thunderstorms heading off out into the Atlantic. This is kind of mashed up into the frontal system itself, strong southerly flow, dry air all around. Boy, you can really see that, too. Very clear skies all throughout this region, low dew points, low humidity, and uh, a nice weather day overall as Emily departs the area. This is the forecast track map. Just thought I'd put it on here for fun. Really nothing of any significance coming from this over the next few days. 
Looking at this product from WSI, Weather Services International, Michael Ventress posted this to his Twitter earlier this morning. A decent chance of some development. Let's draw it in yellow. Out here, according to the ECMWF Ensemble Prediction System, and uh, this is your subtropical and your tropical cyclone risk over the next couple of weeks. See, this ends the 15th. So this is still several days before the traditional ramping up. And when we look at this product, you know, after August 15th, watch what it shows out through here. It's not a guarantee. Nothing's ever 100%, but the signs are definitely there. And this is another one of those signs right here. Check it out. The African dust is still prevalent, but look how far north it is now. The southern extent of it is retreating northward. You know, if that makes sense, it's not as far south. You're not seeing it completely come down here and overwhelm the system, so to speak. It's getting there. It's just a slow process, and this will continue on for the next couple of weeks. And once we get this active Kelvin wave coming across, it's this uh, energy in the tropics that helps to set off convection is one way to look at it. Uh, that'll move across Africa and energize these tropical waves, and then they will move into an environment at that time that is more conducive for development. They will uh, rain and precipitate over western Africa and really cut down on this dust. Uh, like I said, it's just August 1st. You know, two weeks from now, it'll be a completely different story, I do believe. In the Western Pacific, I did not want to finish today's update without talking about this. We have a typhoon out here, Noru, or Noru, however you say it. And it's had a wild life, been out here meandering around. Uh, looked like it was going to maybe die out, but boy, it came back. And now it's forecast to make a run for the southwest part of Japan here over the next several days. And some of these forecasts, uh, from, I guess this is the Joint Typhoon Warning Service. Um, I want to see if that is correct. Where? It's hard to see. It looks like that's Hawaii right there. This comes from the Navy. I just want to make sure I get, give credit where credit is due, right? So who is this from? Let's see if it says it on here. Probably shouldn't worry about it too much, but I think it's from the Joint Typhoon Warning Service. But nevertheless, the forecast here, uh, very tiny point size. <laughs> I have to put my glasses on to read this in the future probably. Going up to about 100 knots uh, right about here and then going down to 95 and 90 knots here and here. Uh, some of the models, uh, the GFS in particular, I probably should just say that, got this down to just record setting levels. It was crazy. It's like they fixed the GFS but they broke the GFS at the same time. It had a pressure in here of 872 millibars. Uh, no, that's not going to happen. I mean, this is 30 degrees north latitude right here. You know what's at 30 degrees north latitude on our side of the world, or most of us anyway? Jacksonville, Florida. Can you imagine an 872 millibar hurricane at the latitude of Jacksonville, Florida? 25 degrees north latitude is Miami, roughly. And it's hard to get an 872 millibar hurricane in Miami, for goodness sakes. So the GFS was just wrong. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> Look at that. It just showed up. It's like, you know, I'm distracted. You know, what did the, the dog and the squirrel? Joint Typhoon Warning Center, not service. There it is. At least I got my credit in there. But um, point is, this is going to be a significant typhoon headed for southwest Japan. So we'll watch this closely, and hopefully the GFS was just completely off its rocker, and we won't have to worry about any 872 millibars, especially when you see this. I mean, it's a you know classic-looking typhoon, I guess, but it seems like a lot of dry air wrapped in there, if you ask me, especially around that core. Um, just you know, it looks like the mature phase uh, as these things go. They roam around for a while. They wax and they wane, and, uh, you know, if the Earth was just completely covered in water, um, I've asked this once before, you would think that you'd have cyclones constantly roaming, but they wouldn't because eventually the heat would just become completely distributed, taken out of the oceans, and it would just be a self-destructive uh, situation where 
you couldn't really have that many cyclones going at once, but when they do roam around like this has been out there for at least 10 days, they do. They start to get this look. It's like it's road weary. But according to Joint Typhoon Warning Center, this should strengthen some as it heads in towards Japan. So we'll watch and see. Maybe uh, a couple of the typhoon chasers will head out there and give us a first-hand look at uh, what the GFS showed as a record-setting typhoon. Probably not going to be that way. Say, I, in fact, I would say it's not going to be. But still a significant impact for Japan. All right, well, that's it for me for today. Uh, probably not going to do an update tomorrow. i got to do a little bit of traveling uh, just briefly here in North Carolina where I live. But then I'll be back on Thursday. We'll take a look at sea surface temperature anomalies as they get updated again on Thursday. And we'll see what's happening by then. Uh, that typhoon will be closing in on Japan, so we'll see what's happening there. But, you know, with things nice and quiet, again, use this time to do something to prepare. I got a tip for you, a suggestion. Uh, if you're a homeowner or a renter and you have insurance, check it. Call your agent, send them an email, and just say, hey, look, whoever it is, Allstate, USAA, nationwide, uh, uh, an off-brand insurance company, whoever it is, Find the email address, send them an email, and just say, look, it's hurricane season, it's August. I'm just curious, if I had a hurricane-related claim, what's the best way to deal with that? And don't let them just say, ah, oh, don't worry about it, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Stay persistent and ask the tough questions. Who do I call? Who do I email? How would I handle the claim after a hurricane? And what's covered? You pay these people to insure you. So make sure they earn their uh, paycheck by advising you on how to handle it if a hurricane comes your way. And remember, flooding isn't covered by homeowners insurance. you got to get that through the NFIP. So ask about that, too. This is the time to do it. Well, actually, flood insurance, you have to do 30 days or more ahead of time. But use this time. I'm serious. It's quiet. Do something. It'll help take the stress off later. Laver. All right. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. Thanks for tuning in. As always, I do appreciate it. I'm Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com. Again, no video tomorrow, but I'll be back on Thursday.